So I feel like we should have a parade this morning. Here's I'm a little hot. Can you turn it down a little bit? Just a little bit. I feel like we should have a parade this morning because we defeat. Who did we defeat anyway? The Eritreans or the, who did we defeat this last couple of weeks? A victory parade. The boys are back from the front and uh, victorious this morning out keeping us safe for the last uh, like three weeks or so. And uh, listen, I love my time in the army. But I'm okay that I didn't have to go to the field for three weeks. Like, I'm really glad that you guys did that. Like, I'm, I'm super proud of you all for doing that for me on my behalf. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 this morning as we continue our study through the book of Ephesians entitled, Know God, Live Like It. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, we got some right there in the back. Uh, you can snag a copy or Mr. Neal will give you a copy. We love to put the Word of God into the hands of his people. It is our privilege to do that. Uh, so we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. Thanks to everyone also who came out yesterday to help us give the church an enema. I said it again. Boy, we filled up an entire dumpster full of, of stuff yesterday. That was awesome. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard work yesterday. Many hands make light work. So thanks for everybody that came out for that. And uh, so let's get into the word in Ephesians chapter 3. We're talking about gospel responsibility this morning. Gospel responsibility from the word that Paul writes to these discouraged Christians in the city of Ephesus. I want to start in verse 1. The word says this. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord lasts forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. God, we thank you for your word from the book of Ephesians. And so, Lord, I'm praying this morning you would grant your people repentance. Lord, that you would call your people to obedience. Lord, I'm praying that this would be the morning where you would move richly and dwell richly in the hearts of your people. And we just ask all of these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to talk about gospel responsibility this morning from this section, uh, this, this, uh, this passage of Scripture. And it's interesting that we see that, that Paul has been writing to these discouraged Christians in the city of Ephesus, and they're discouraged for a number of different reasons. And he starts off by reminding them of every spiritual blessing they've received in the heavenly places. It's like, what have we received as believers? But everything. And then Paul prays for them at the end of chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, he reminds them that they have been saved by grace through faith. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. But God made them alive together in Christ. So what an amazing thing that is. And then he talks about the church, how God has taken Jews and Gentiles and formed them into one new man, which is the church. And what an amazing blessing that the church is. And then we start in verse 1 of chapter 3, and Paul begins a prayer for these Ephesians. He's prayed in chapter 1 for them, and he prays for them again, starting in verse 1. But it's interesting, he is likely dictating this letter to a scribe, or what they would have called an amanuensis. And he interrupts himself immediately in verse 2. And for verses 2 through 13 or 2 through 12, and there's two long Greek sentences as he's interrupted his own train of thought as he's dictating this letter to his scribe before he resumes his prayer in verse 14. And so today we are going to tear apart the first long sentence from verses 2 through 7 and talk about gospel responsibility this morning. Gospel responsibility. 
Listen, I don't feel like I've been preached to unless I feel a little bit of a sting from the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would maybe wire brush us up a little bit this morning. You know, I love you, right? Right. You know that I love you. Let's get into the text. Paul writes in verse one, he says, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. When we talk about gospel responsibility, the first thing we've got to understand is that gospel responsibility implies a willingness to suffer. A willingness to suffer. And we see this in Paul. Paul exemplifies a willingness to suffer. Now, if you recall, Paul is formerly known as Saul. He was a Pharisee. He was a hater of Christians. And I can empathize with Paul because I was a hater of Christians up until the age of 32 when I was called to salvation by the Lord. But we read that Paul was even present when they stoned Stephen to death, the very first Christian martyr. They stoned him to death and Paul was there. and He actually watched the coats of the people stoning Stephen to death. They threw their coats in a pile and said, here, Paul, watch our coats while we stone Stephen to death. And it says that he approved of the stoning of Stephen. He was there and he approved of it. And then in chapter nine, it says he was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so he goes to the high priest and asks for a letter so he can take this letter to the city of Damascus and he can go door to door and he can find members of the way and take them back to Jerusalem to prison so that he could persecute them. But then along the road to Damascus, you're hopefully familiar with the story. God violated Paul's free will and saved him. And then he says this, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God had decreed not only Paul's salvation, but that Paul would suffer on behalf of the name. And we read exactly that. I mean, he suffers almost immediately. He's in Damascus and he starts to preach Christ. And immediately his friends, his former friends, the Jews, start trying to kill him immediately. So much so he has to be assisted in escaping the city by the disciples. So immediately Paul begins to suffer on behalf of the name of Jesus. He spells out his sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Think about the things that Paul endured. It says he endured imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. He received five times, 40 lashes, less one. He was, he was whipped three times. I was beaten with rods. He was stoned nearly to death. He was shipwrecked. He was on frequent journeys. He was in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from his own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. He had sleepless nights. He was hungry and thirsty. He was without food. He was in cold and exposure. And perhaps most of all, verse 28, he says this, there's the daily anxiety for, of pressure on me for all the churches. Paul says, not only did I suffer in all these ways physically, but I got all of this daily pressure on me, all of this anxiety on me for all of these different churches. So he was suffering emotionally, suffering spiritually, so to speak. And then we read on that Paul ends up getting put into prison in, in the end of the book of Acts. And then we read in Ephesians chapter three, verse one, that he writes from prison. He's actually in prison at this point in time. He says, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. He's suffering in prison. He has no idea if he will ever be released. And history in, in the book of Acts ends uh, at this imprisonment, so we don't know exactly uh, when and if he was released. We know that uh, he ends up being beheaded in prison, uh, possibly in a later imprisonment. Uh, there was possibly a fourth missionary journey that we don't know if it was, but Paul was beheaded for his faith. He suffered his entire life as after he was called to repentance and to follow the Lord Jesus. Paul is not alone in that. John the Baptist was beheaded in prison. The very first martyr we talked about was Stephen, who was a deacon. He was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 12 records James, the brother of John, is, is impaled by the sword in prison. 
They had a willingness to suffer on behalf of the gospel. And they weren't the only ones. All of the apostles, the original 12 minus Judas, died a martyr's death. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Philip was executed. James was stoned and clubbed to death. Matthias was burned to death. John died an old man in exile on the island. Even he was at one time boiled in oil. Listen, Jesus tells us to, take, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross daily. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. What does it mean to deny yourself? But to deprive yourself of something that you may actually be entitled to. And to take up your cross daily. What does it mean to take up your cross daily? I mean, I've heard it preached that your cross is, is whatever hard thing you have to bear in life. It's your, you know, your, your wicked stepmother that you got or your, your mother-in-law or your father-in-law or your horrible job. That you, that's your cross you got to bear daily. But Jesus' audience would have known exactly what he was talking about when he talked about the cross. What he means is that every single day we wake up and we say, what do we love more than Jesus today? including our lives, and are we willing to lay that down today? He may not ask for your life today. He may, but are you willing to give it today? You have a willingness to suffer. You have a willingness to suffer with joy. With joy. Not with joy, the person I just happened to look with. <laughs> I love the letter to the Philippians. That's another letter that Paul writes from prison. And again, prison in those days was not, you know, three hots and a cot with, you know, cable TV and an hour in the artist. I mean, he has no idea if he's going to be released. He has no idea what that's going to look like. He's in house arrest. He's going to be executed. He just doesn't know. But yet he writes to the Philippians and over and over again, he says, rejoice, be joyful, rejoice in the Lord. I have rejoiced for this reason. I rejoice, rejoice. And Paul from prison says this to them. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is encouraging them from prison. I love one of my favorite passages of scriptures, Acts chapter 5, verse 41. It says that the apostles are called in before the high priest and they're, and they're beaten and clubbed and they're ordered, hey, don't go and preach the name of Jesus anymore. And they say, well, we must obey God, not men. And then they leave prison and they go out and it says that they were joyful because they were counted worthy to suffer on behalf of the name. Even back in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 13, it's kind of a bookend to this interruption. He says, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Listen, I, I don't seek out suffering. I, I, I'm as big of a wimp as there is. I, I, don't, I don't want to suffer. It's not like I go out and go, persecute me now. But I, I would hate to show up on that day and stand before the Lord and never have been considered worthy to suffer on behalf of the name. Let's be honest if we can. I pray that we would be honest with ourselves this morning. When was the last time you went without on behalf of the gospel? When was the last time you denied yourself on behalf of the gospel? Listen, the gospel life is a life of self-denial. It is a life of sacrifice. The gospel life is a life of suffering with joy. Listen, there are many times when I wrestle with the joke. Sometimes it seems that the Western church has become, that the Western church plays games. We, what would we make important but our comfort and our happiness and our security? And what does the Western church do with the congregants? But I seek to offer you the illusion of service without actually asking you to sacrifice. Because if I actually ask you to give sacrificially, you may just go somewhere else and take your tithe check with you. This is the joke in many ways that the Western church has become. We are prisoners of comfort. We are prisoners of security. We're prisoners of our own wealth. We're prisoners of prosperity. We are prisoners of personal safety. That's not how things ought to be. Listen, I've been praying all week for you this week. 
All week I've been praying for you and I've been praying for me. And I have not been praying that the Lord would prosper you financially. I have not been praying that the Lord would prosper you materially. I have not been praying for your health this week. I have been praying this week that the Lord would pour you out like a drink offering. That the Lord would take you and use up every single bit of you. That the Lord would take you and squeeze every drop of blood out of the turnip that he possibly could. And then he'd fill you up again and do it all over. And that you would yield to that. Listen, we talk about gospel responsibility. We talk about a willingness to suffer. A willingness to suffer with joy. With joy. Let's get back to the text. Paul says, this reason I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And then he interrupts himself in verse 2. He says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Listen, let's talk about this existence of gospel responsibility. I mean, don't just take my word for it that you have a responsibility to the gospel. Let's see this in the text. He says, I assume that you've heard of this, the stewardship of God's grace. What is the stewardship of God's grace? Well, when I talk about stewardship, many of you start thinking about money. Uh, we were talking about stewardship and reformation on Monday night. By the way, come to Reformation Monday night at 630. That was a good plug. We were talking about stewardship, and many folks went right to money. And, and we should be good stewards of the money that God gives to us. Again, how much of your money does God want? Every single penny of your money. And so we should be good stewards of them. But stewardship is so much more. It literally means just to, 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 to have ownership of something that is entrusted to you or to, to, to use something well that God has entrusted to you. And here Paul says, I am a steward of God's grace. Just as you, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus are a steward, not so much of your money, you good stewards of your money, but you are stewards of God's grace. Allow me to remind you, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, of the grace that you have received. The only reason that you are sitting here today and that God has not sent you to hell, which is exactly where you deserve to be, is because of his grace and mercy and love. That's the only reason. The only reason you woke up this morning and God did not send you to hell this morning is because of his grace. That's exactly what we deserve. But in his grace, he saved you and redeemed you. He woke you up today. He gave you breath. He gave you life. This is the grace that he gives to us. This is the grace that he gave to Paul. And Paul says, I'm a steward of this grace. And then he says, for you. For you. I've got news for you, church. It's not about you. It's not about you. God has given you grace. Not so that you can just walk around and be like, well, I'm saved. My, my tent is up. It's about others. You are a steward of God's grace on behalf of somebody else. I love the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Jesus gives the parable of the talents in the Olivet in this course. Uh, one of his last uh, public addresses before his execution and what is a parable but a story designed to teach a moral lesson and so he tells the story and in the story there's a, uh, a master who has three servants and he goes away on a trip and he leaves uh, with his servants money he calls them talents and a talent is a unit of money that's a pretty sizable amount and so with one of the servants he leaves five talents uh, another servant he leaves two talents and the last servant, he leaves one talent. And he goes on his journey. And when he returns, he comes back to see his servants and to see how they did. And the one servant who had five talents said, look, I, I took your five talents you gave me and I used it. And I made five more talents. And the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the other servant says, well, look, Master, I, I took your two talents that you gave me. It was only two, but I took the two, and I, I used this two talents, and I made two more talents, and, and here they are. And, and 
The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. The last servant, though, he took his single talent that he had given, and he had buried it. And so when the master came back, he says to his master, he says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground, and here you have what is yours. He did nothing with the talent that was left to him. And the master says this, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received the interest. And he says, for to everyone who has will be more will be given and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And then he says this to the servant, cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You do realize he's not talking about investing money as the purpose of this parable. He's talking about gospel responsibility. I love Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says this. He says, all this is from God. This is the words of Paul who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave it to us. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, God has entrusted to you the ministry of, of reconciliation. This is gospel responsibility. And we see in the Bible that, that God has instituted different structures and institutions to assist us and to help us in our gospel responsibility. Listen, I'm the teaching elder of this church, and Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll appoint Eric and Eric as elders of this church. We've got a couple of other men in the pipeline. And one day we will give an account for how well we steward this church. James chapter 3, verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. Church elders, the, the men, the leaders that God has put to lead his church have a responsibility to the people in the church. This is gospel responsibility. Listen, if you are a husband, God has given you a position as the spiritual head of your family. And one day I will also give an account for how well I led my family. Did I wash my wife in the water of the word as Ephesians chapter 5 commands me to do? Mothers and fathers, you have a gospel responsibility to your children. God has entrusted your children to you that you would bring them up in the wisdom and instruction of the Lord. But it's not just mothers and fathers. It's not just husbands and wives. It's not just elders. Christians. Listen, the word tells us if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, he has given you spiritual gifts. He has empowered you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the church, for the building up of his church. It's not about you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul told us that he prepared works for you from before the foundation of the world. Listen, I want for just a minute, I want you to do a thought exercise with me. I want you to think about the people in your life. Close your eyes if you need to. I want you to see their faces, your, your, your co workers, your loved ones, your families, your friends. Whoever, your neighbors, and consider that God in his sovereign hand has specifically put those people in your life for you to be a steward of the gospel of God's grace. This is what the word tells us. The conclusions are unavoidable. I love Proverbs 24, verse 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And then he says this, he says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. 
Think about all those faces you just visualized. If you, if they do not know the Lord Jesus, if they've never been redeemed, then the word tells us that they are being taken away to death. They're stumbling to the slaughter. And we have this command to rescue them, to hold them back, to plead with them. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, be reconciled to Christ. This is the existence of gospel responsibility. Gospel revelation is what demands gospel responsibility. Let's get back to the text. Verses 3 through 6, Paul starts talking about the mystery of Christ. He says in verse 3, the mystery was made known to him by revelation. Again, Paul received special revelation. He was on the road to Damascus. Jesus appeared to him in a supernatural and special way on the road to Damascus. He saved him and then gave him this supernatural call to take the ministry to the Gentiles. This happened to Paul. He says this is the mystery of Christ. And the mystery down in verse 6 is that the, 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 the Gentiles were saved just like the Jews were. That was a mystery to them. They couldn't understand why God would take Jews and Gentiles and make the church. But he did. And it was a great mystery to them. But he received the gospel by revelation. And then he took the gospel and assumed responsibility. Listen, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you have received the gospel and been saved because somebody else assumed responsibility. Let me see if I can walk the dog on that for you. In 1982, there was a young country boy down in Savannah, Tennessee named Larry. And he had been saved. He had, he had heard the gospel message and believed and repented of his sins and been saved. And then a short time later, he began to feel the call of God to preach. And he's like, God, I'm, I'm a teenager. God, I'm, he was like 16. And so he went to his pastor and said, the Lord is convicting me to preach and to be a pastor. A couple of months later, he finds himself at the age of 17 as a pastor of his first church preaching the gospel. And for 20 some years, that man was faithful to proclaim the gospel at every single opportunity that God gave him. And in 2005, a young army officer walked through the doors of the church and heard the same man preach the gospel week after week until the Holy Spirit changed his heart and he was saved. And that young man was me. I was saved because God ordained it, but I was saved because this man was obedient to the gospel call that God had put upon his heart to preach the gospel. Gospel revelation demands gospel responsibility. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, but it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. God has decided that it is the preaching of the gospel message that leads to the salvation of souls. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, the gospel message is the power of God for salvation. We've got to know the gospel message. Do you know the gospel message? There is rampant gospel ignorance in the church today. I just ask people all the time, do you know the gospel message? People who are lifelong church attenders cannot articulate the gospel message. And so do you know the gospel message? Do you know that God saves sinners? Do you know that every single one of you was born as a rebel against a holy and a righteous God? But that God sent his son and pleased him to send his son to take on flesh, to send him to the cross, to live a perfectly obedient life and then suffer on the cross a death for all who would believe. And if you would repent and believe this gospel message, do you know the gospel message? Do you believe the gospel message? Do you preach it? Do you proclaim it? Do you herald it? Do you announce it? Listen, a gospel message unpreached is a gospel message unheard, which is a gospel message unbelieved. And apart from the proclamation of the gospel message, what hope do the people have? Maybe you say, I'm no preacher. Isn't that why we pay you 
And unfortunately, that unbiblical attitude is pervasive across the Western church. And it's a function of poor, unbiblical ecclesiology, which is how we think about the church, and which leads to unbiblical church polity, which is how we run the church and the professionalization of the pastorate and the invention of all these great and glorious church staffs all with the explicit purpose to allow you, the church attender, the opportunity to abrogate your responsibility. And we see that worse than children's ministry, youth ministry. I'll just take my kids to church and let the church fix them up. How do I know that? Because that's what I said when I first went to church. I'll just take my kids to church and let the church fix them. Little did I know that I was the one that needed to be fixed Listen, the church ought to equip you. The church ought to assist you. The church ought to reinforce what you do. But if you say, I'm no preacher, I beg to differ. God has granted you an audience. Maybe it's an audience of one. Maybe it's an unbelieving husband. Maybe it's a wife, children, family, friends, all those people that you just thought about and envisioned in your mind. The Great Commission is for all of us. Gospel revelation leads to gospel responsibility. Let's get back to the text. Lastly, gospel responsibility requires gospel accountability. Verse 7, Paul writes, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Paul was made a minister. Paul did not go looking for God. Romans chapter 3 tells us that no one seeks after God. Paul was not looking for God. Paul was not looking to be a minister to the Gentiles. That's not what he would have chosen. That's not what he ever would have chosen. He was a hater of the Gentiles. But that's exactly who God called him to go to. I can't find anywhere in Scripture where God asks for our permission. I can't find that anywhere. Gospel responsibility is non-negotiable. He doesn't ask us. He doesn't ask you. He sent Paul to the Gentiles. He sent Jonah to the Ninevites, the wicked Assyrians. Jonah tried to run. God said, not so much. You are mine. And I have decreed that you will go to Nineveh. And that's exactly where Jonah ended up going. Now he went against his will, but he went. And we see God calls us to go to the Samaritans, the people that we hate the most. Think of the people that you would least likely go to. That's exactly who God is calling you to go to, to the ends of the earth. Let's get back to Proverbs chapter 24. He says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Listen to this. This is very important. He says, if you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Listen, you can say a lot of things. I mean, the most honest thing you could say is I'm apathetic and I don't care. You could say I'm too busy, which is really a translation for I'm not prioritizing gospel in business. You could say I'm, just, I'm, I'm ill-equipped. I don't know what to do, which is really a translation for I'm not immersed in a local church that's equipping me for the things that I ought to do. You can say a lot of different things, but you can never say, at least now, that you did not no, we're all guilty of the sin of silence. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talks about giving an account for every idle word spoken. Is there a more idle word than an unspoken gospel word? How do I know this is true? Every month for the last six to eight months, we've been going into the apartment complex to take the gospel down the road. Two, maybe three of you guys, maybe four, have ever been. Just this week, we were in the trailer park next door. Second time in a month, nobody came. Your persistent disobedience to the gospel responsibility 
is not unique to you. Almost no Christians, professing Christians, ever take the gospel message to anybody else. Almost none of them in direct disobedience to the Great Commission. But listen to me, your gospel disobedience does not nullify one iota your gospel responsibility. God does not ask, he requires. Elders of the church, mothers and fathers, Christians, you have failed in your gospel responsibilities. All of you, every single one of you, if we're honest. And this is church, I pray we could be honest here today. And so your response to that is one of two things right now. Apathy, I don't care. I've got more important stuff to do. Maybe anger. How dare this man tell these things to me? Or maybe there's a burden upon your heart. I have been disobedient. Just like me. Every single day I walk right past dozens of people who are not reconciled to God and in the hardness and callousness of my heart, I deny them the very thing that they need. And so I pray that you would be broken this morning and have a burden. I'd like to help you lift that burden though, if I could. Can I help you lift this burden? We've got to change the way that we think. A gospel responsibility is not a burden. If we look at this thing as a burden, we're thinking about it completely wrong. Listen, we're leaving out part of the gospel. In his death, in his life, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, what we read is that the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. It has been bestowed upon us. In salvation, you have been justified. God has declared you innocent. You're guilty, but God has declared you innocent, pouring out his wrath for your sins upon Christ on the cross. But it's more than that. Not only did Jesus die the death you should have died, he lived the life that you should have lived. He lived a perfectly obedient life to God, perfectly obedient to God's law. That's what righteousness means, is obedience to God's law. And that has been bestowed upon you also. So God does not look at you and see the wicked sinner who is gospel irresponsible. He looks at you and he sees the righteousness of Christ. Did you know that today? That forevermore when God looks upon you, he does not see you as the wicked sinner that you are. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees the obedience of Christ. Listen, this gospel responsibility that we've been given is not, it's not a burden. It is a treasure. It is an opportunity. It's a privilege. You fail. I failed a million times. I fail every single day. I fail this afternoon. I guarantee you this. But repent of your sin and say, God, help me to assume this gospel responsibility. Say, God, I won't let you down anymore. You will. God, would you help me not to let you down anymore? Because it is a privilege. It's a blessing. It's a treasure. It's a daunting task. Yes, it's an awesome responsibility. But God has called you to join him in this. Don't be weary and burdened. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, what is Jesus' yoke? But the salvation of the world. Join him in bearing that yoke. He's carried it already. Join him in it, in this gospel responsibility. <coughs> I'm going to pray in just a minute. I pray that you would, if you need to repent, repent. But then get back in the fight and say, God, give me a fire. Ignite this gospel flame in my heart. <laughs> Can you imagine Paul's joy when he walked into eternity? And he was greeted by two groups of people. And welcomed. He was welcomed by 
the very people he killed. But then he was welcomed by those that he suffered on behalf of so greatly. And he said, thank you, brother, for enduring so much for me to bring me the gospel message. Thank you that you would do that for me. Can you imagine your joy when you walk into heaven? Even if it's one, just one. Praise God. Would you join him in your gospel responsibility this morning? Let us pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much, Lord, that you have entrusted this ministry of reconciliation to us. That we're just we're just jars of clay. We're just clay pots, God. But you've taken this invaluable treasure of the gospel and entrusted it to us and placed it in us. And so, Lord, just forgive us. Forgive me, God. I'm so disobedient to your gospel call. Lord, every single day I walk past people who are not redeemed. Every single day I walk past oceans of people who don't know you as Lord and Savior. And I keep my mouth shut in perfect disobedience. Every single day I fail to minister to my wife and children the way that I ought to. So forgive me for that, Father. But God, I know that your word tells us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So God, I pray that we as the people of the way, we would see this awesome privilege you've given us to join you in gospel ministry. God, that our hearts would break for the lost people we know in our lives that don't know you. And that we would set our hearts that we would be the ones to take to them the words of life. God, if not us, who? If not now, when? So God, forgive us of our sins. Call us to obedience. God, I pray that you are raising up a generation of workers right here at this little church on Tiny Town Road. Lord, that we would walk out of this place into the harvest as workers of joy, with joy. God, maybe you've called us to suffer, but that we would be willing to suffer with joy. Suffer on behalf of others. Suffer on behalf of the message. So God, I pray that you would forgive us for our silence. And may the name of Jesus ever be on the tip of our tongues. May the gospel message just come out of our mouths. May we just open our mouths and the gospel message just comes out. Lord, may we just have this fire inside of us that we're unable to contain of the gospel message. God, consume us in this way. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we